thank you guys so much, Nicole and Craig. That was really, really, really fun. You guys are yes, awesome. It it's so, the watching the jewelry making, it's so fun. But I do have to say that a few times I've watched it on like 1.5 speed. <laughs> You're just like a machine. <laughs> <laughs> it's very impressive. <laughs> Would that it were that easy, right? So. So um, I'm going to give people a little while to come in. I don't think I have to do anything. I think people are just arriving. So let me know if uh, if you're trapped. Turning off my video. Oh, sorry, Matt. See ya. Um, so I'm really, really happy you guys could be here. We're we're recording this, so this is an invitation only for Gold Club members. But and, but we'll show it to Silver Club members. So don't do anything crazy, okay, people? Um, and uh, when oh, you guys moved. You moved again. Um, thank you so much for taking us on your adventure, you guys. It's really, really fun. And I actually had the opportunity to go with Nicole to the beach in Scotland a hundred years ago when we could travel. Um, and it was very funny because I, I showed up from California with my, like a windbreaker and my heavy sweater, you know, no boots, no anything. And it snowed. Oh. So we get to the beach and I'm like all in like scarves. Oh, I get it and everything <laughs> and then Nicole walks up and she's got stylish boots and a little tunic and I was just like oh my god this is like California and Europe right here <laughs> this is the difference <laughs> but did you find anyway, any I, did find, I don't think I found any sponge wear but I did find a turquoise blue stopper so I was pretty darn Ooh. happy that was like like I never have to find another stopper now I'm oh wow pretty much done that's so, exciting yeah I was I was excited and Nicole was mad. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Very happy for Just you. <laughs> no, I was there. It was very very <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I don't know if you guys have followed, um, seen any of the other videos by Nicole and Craig, but they have a whole channel and every week, I don't know if it's every week, but it seems like it. There's a new video. They every take week. us to the beach. They show us around. Um, uh, find some cool stuff and Nicole shows how she makes jewelry out of it and great music, great visuals. Just, it's so relaxing. If you haven't subscribed, just subscribe, go back and look at them. You have to see the cool transfer wear thing they found last week, this Greek God or something. It was very, very cool. So did you find out what it was? No, not yet. Uh, we have uh, asked in a transfer wear club, but uh, we've not got any, uh, well, we've not got any positive response so far. It might be some sort of maybe a theater mask or something like that. Yeah, yeah Greek you know, I, mask was the... yeah, I tried looking up. I like it was like, you know, happy, sad, drama face, theater mask. And I, I couldn't find it, but it was very fun. No. Anyway, just watch their videos. You never know what you're going to find. It's like beachcombing and just really, really <laughs> fun and relaxing. So you guys, thank you very much. So um, you might know Nicole because she has, uh, she spoke at last year's virtual beachcombing festival. She's written several articles for the magazine. She has one in the next issue. Um, and, Craig, <laughs> and so you may, you may have seen her stuff and you may have seen her Etsy shop and just, she has just beautiful stuff. Um, and then Craig is uh, our history expert. And so he's, uh, maybe you guys tell us a little bit about like Nicole, how you ended up in Scotland and then Craig, a little bit of your history and why you know everything that you know. <laughs> I'll let Nicole start then. Yeah. Okay. So, well, how did I end up okay. in Scotland? Well, <laughs> Um, as you may or may not know, I'm actually German, <laughs> and oh. um, um, yeah, so we met. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took her away from Germany and brought her That's to good. Scotland. Good <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got married in Frankfurt, and uh, a few months later, uh, Craig wanted to well, kind of go back to Scotland and finish up his PhD, and so we moved to Edinburgh. And we lived there for a few years, and uh, then we moved to Cooper about eight years ago now. So now we are really coastal, and we're only 15 minutes away from the beach, uh, but we live kind of in, in the hills at the moment. So, uh, But we have the River Tay on one side and the River Forth on the other, so it's, uh, it's really great for going to the beach. So, yeah, so Tear, how do you spell that? T-E-A-R? No. What's Which the one? first river called? Oh, the Tay, the River Tay. That's the um, T-A-Y. Uh, T-A-Y, oh, that's the one uh, on where, where Dundee oh. is. 
Yeah. So, Got how it. did you uh, become the history cool. expert? <laughs> I've always had an interest in history since uh, I was very young. Um, originally, I was interested in oddly enough Greek mythology. That's really what kind of uh, got me interested in history. Um, but I went to university as a mature student when I was 25, and I actually studied social anthropology. Um, so I'm yeah. interested in human culture, human history, um, settlement, you know, basically why people do the things that they do. And I have a strong interest in material culture. So wow. I think our, our interests kind of come together through the material culture aspects of it. Mm-hmm. Um, my interest in, well, my, my speciality is really the Pacific. So I spent several years in the Pacific um, working in oh. Vanuatu um, as a social anthropologist and a government volunteer wow. for, for the government of that's Vanuatu. Where you get the Coke bottles. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's, that's Nicole, where we get the Coke bottles. The Coke bottles that you found. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we have some yeah, to show you. Cool. <laughs> so after coming back from oh, Vanuatu. Good. Well, great. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Yeah, after coming back to Vanuatu, I moved to Germany for a year and um, Nicole and I decided to move back here. Um, Mm -hmm. I was teaching at various universities and then when I stopped doing that, we thought, how can we put my interests in culture and history and that kind of thing together with the kind of thing that Nicole was doing? And this is what we did. (laughs) Scottish Mud Lamping was born. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) How many videos do you guys have so far? When did we start? Uh, June. June last year. So mm-hmm. one one a week since June last year. I've lost count. It's over 50, I yeah. think. Wow. But there's a few odd videos in there as well, yeah. competition videos. But the, of the the style of video that you saw today, there's around 40, 50. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've been busy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Will you guys ask them your questions? Oh, my God. Well, we can start by showing you those Coke bottles. Hi, yes. Bertha. Oh, hello. I was surprised I was invited. I thought I didn't guess. I didn't guess the pieces of of stones. I'm so happy to see you. It's lovely to hello, see you. Hello, everybody. Good to see you in person. Yeah. Yes, I'm. I'm Everyone that's else. Me. Sorry, I buy too many things. I love your stuff. <laughs> That's very kind. Very kind. Are you wearing something? Oh, you're oh. wearing a marble. Oh, yeah, I'm wearing <laughs> marble sisters. <laughs> yeah. Sissy, you got yours. <laughs> Wish I could really travel. Ah, Sissy as well. See, <laughs> everybody's got. Awesome. <laughs> it's a club membership. Oh, well, well. <laughs> oh that's <laughs> lovely. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> Oh, that's very sweet. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, that's very nice. So you mentioned a couple of books that you have, and then you mentioned catalogs. So what are the catalogs? Are those like old catalogs from days gone by or current? The old catalogs that I was talking about earlier are from the Methvin factory. So the Methvin factory was the factory that was almost uh, very, very close um, to the area where we find the the little shards of pottery now. It was actually just behind the beach there. I think you've pointed out that you can see some of the old buildings, uh, or one of the old buildings. Um, yeah, well, most of the buildings have now been torn down where the potteries actually were, but there's a, like a little lane that goes up kind of, if you, if you stand at the beach and it goes up kind of right behind you, about a couple of hundred meters, and that's where the pottery was. And there used to be um, a, a, a horse-drawn cart and uh, it would be full of the seconds and the broken pieces. And they would just go right to the beach, right where that little burn is, the little creek river. Um, and that's where they would dump the broken pottery pieces. And that's why in that particular area, we find the pottery that we do. That's so cool. The, the catalogs, what we've found so far, are really just lists of named patterns. Mm. But we haven't actually found any photographs to link those oh. named patterns to uh, to any images. Um, so some of them, and Nicole's mentioned what we assume to be names of some, there was a maple leaf pattern and some of the other patterns as well. But what we'd really love to do is get into Kirkcaldy, uh, the museum archives there and see what they have tucked away somewhere. But everything's kind of still a wee bit tricky at the moment, as I'm sure it is yeah, for most yeah. people. I don't know what so you're once that, about. 
No, no, no. Just oh, no, no, yeah. past as well. <laughs> Lucky you. So, <laughs> is sponge still made today? Ah. Oh. Sorry, the sponge Um, Yeah, Emma Bridgewater uh, makes something that is kind of akin to sponge wear. Uh, and I think she's probably the only person kind of in that she's based in England um, and that's she's kind of well-known designer but that's the one that kind of springs to mind. Because I live in New Jersey and um, I've been beachcombing maybe maybe five years and I've only found one beautiful piece of spongeware and I'm wondering if that was imported or if there are also U.S. manufacturers of spongeware. I don't really know Ah, well, um, a lot of the spongeware was exported kind of world worldwide. Um, mm -hmm. we, we made the video, um, like the one that we also showed for the uh, Beachcombing um, Festival. Uh, and in that, there's uh, quite a lot of information. It's quite dense on history. Uh, okay. And I'll tell you a, a lot of you know, where the, the pottery was made. And uh, there were a couple of places in, in Canada where it was made. Um, mm -hmm. Um, can't remember. I don't think there was anything made in New Jersey, but a lot of the um, the people, the, the Scots people who left Scotland and moved to other countries, they took their spongeware with them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. every now and again, you might be able to find the piece. But it was very popular, uh, kind of worldwide and in Australia as it's well. So beautiful! I just love it. <laughs> it's have, my favorite. <laughs> I have a question. So who used the spongeware? Was it uh, suppose the rich people didn't buy spongeware? Was it more lower, no, not lower class, but middle class people who could afford it? It was like affordable pottery. It was very cheap. The oh, okay. um, the spongeware it was. I mean, the, the plain pottery that would have been your cheapest uh, pottery that you could buy, um, and then the spongeware because it was so sort of rudimentary decorated and uh, very quick to to kind of make if you imagine you've got like like potato prints so you would have the plate here and you would kind of print along and that would be done relatively quickly and yeah. uh, a lot of the potteries were so ashamed uh, of <laughs> the spongeware uh, that they oh. produced in, in high numbers that they didn't mark the pieces on the back you know when you turn over a piece of pottery and it'll say wedgewood or something on it and a lot of the potteries did not mark their pieces. That's why it's so difficult to, um, well, to, to attribute the pottery to particular um, manufacturers. Okay. Of course, there was the secondary uh, sale that happened because of the tile burn as well, because the Methven pottery dumped so many pieces that had slight errors on them. As you saw in the video there, young girls went along and filled up baskets and then sold that door to door. So the people who couldn't afford to buy even the cheap spongeware pottery were still able to get some spongeware through this black market at the young girls of Kirkcaldy operated. Mm -hmm. And now it's it's really quite expensive. If you want to buy uh, one of these little bowls that you can you can see on eBay sometimes, mm -hmm. they are between like eighty and a hundred pounds now. If you want to buy a good one, wow. so that's uh, quite hard to imagine. <laughs> what are the sponges like? Are they like super fine, like foam, or is it like? Like I'm having a hard time. Marine sponges. Yeah, yeah. So there's some. I think it's not in this film, but in a, I th it's a, another film coming up because mm -hmm. I remember doing this section. Mm -hmm. There are some very abstract sponge patterns. So they used very um, just natural marine sponges, mm -hmm. and so you can see the very abstract patterns. But for some of the things, some of the the more obviously figurative patterns, the I think Nicole. I know it's more about that. Mm. So. Yeah, well, you know you how you get these kind of natural sponges for the shower nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, no, not the, the, not the, the no, 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 they're hard. But yeah, these these the squishy ones, right. and they grow uh, in the sea. But the the bit where they get attached to like a stone, that's quite hard, and then that gets cut off because nobody wants that on the sponge. And that bit was used to. Uh, make the uh, make the sponges they were then put on a stick so you you have a stick and at the end of it you have uh the, yeah well, yeah yeah like a that. bit like a stencil yeah like the kind of hard like part of that stamp. marine sponge yes mm -hmm. exactly like a rubber stamp yeah <laughs> 
can you still see can you still see me can you still see me i can't see you oh because i lost the picture i can only hear you sorry Oh. Oh. No, we, we can still see you and we can still hear you. <laughs> okay, so I can't do this. <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> okay. I can oh, show I you a couple of the... Um... You're back. You're back. I can see you. <laughs> I can show you a couple of the books that I really like, if you want. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll vanish you. <laughs> I'll entertain you while the cool. <laughs> <laughs> They're not far. Yeah. So, um, all right. So, this is the one that was uh, quoted in the latest video. So, it's Kakodi Potteries. Does that read backwards to everybody else? Um, I don't know. Does <laughs> it? No. <laughs> no, it's no. right. No. No. All right. Yeah, it's okay for you. Just <laughs> not for, for us. <laughs> So this is by Carol McNeil and it's called Kakodi Potteries and she's written a couple of books that we have and this is another one also on uh, Potteries of Kakodi uh, and it's uh, the home of Weemswear. So both of these books are really, really good. Uh, I can highly recommend these. <laughs> um, and there is a little and, book. Uh, I have a question. You know, Nicole, you've said that a, a lot of this pottery was made there but then shipped everywhere. So even though it's like so specific to the potteries in Kirkcaldy, that could, we could find that on our beach anywhere, right? Yeah. If we're lucky. We've seen it in museums so, in Australia. So yeah, so that, this, yeah, so this book would be appropriate even if you don't live there, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just really, um, I mean, this one is relatively particular about the, the potteries, the four or five potteries that were situated in, in Kokodi. Uh, there's only the one pottery really that dumped their, uh, their broken pieces onto the beach. So you can pretty much say that's mostly all from the Methven or the Lynx pottery, as it's also known. Uh, but there were other potteries uh, in the town of Kakodi around about the same time, and they all produced different styles um, of uh, of pottery. So, but I think yes, that that as a guide to certainly the mm -hmm. stuff that was exported from Scotland yeah. and found its way onto the beaches, well, into households before it got to beaches, mm -hmm. um, all around the world. Yeah, that that book would be a, a reasonably good reference for that kind of thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. And this one, this one is um, also very good. This is um, from the late uh, Henry E. Kelly. Um, it's called uh, Spongeware Makers, Marks and Patterns. And there are just, this is just chock a block full of lots of uh, patterns and pictures and great photos. And uh, this is probably the one that we used most to. Um, if you can that? see, yeah, so we're not going to be able to, <laughs> so, this is the one where we found most of the matches for our pottery pieces, so that's a really nice book. Yeah. What was his their name again? Henry? Henry uh, E. Kelly. Kelly. <coughs> yeah. What we can do, we can maybe make a short bibliography of this, send That'd it be to great. you, and That'd be great. That'd be distribute. Yeah, and then you I've got a little one. You. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, you're lucky you live near a beach. I don't live near a beach. <laughs> we're no. so many. We are really, really lucky. We have so many miles uh -huh. of coast uh, all around. As Nicole said earlier, we're between the River Forth and the River Tay. So the area that we live in has maybe 50 miles of coast going around in one direction mm -hmm. and all the way around mm -hmm. uh, the other direction as well. So we have coasts on either side of us. We're incredibly lucky in this part of Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, Sorry. I'm <laughs> 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 and this is this is just the last one, the last book I want to show you, just very quickly. It's more kind of booklet. Um, it's really cheap if you want to get something really, really cheap. And it was only a couple of pounds on, on eBay. These are all uh, pre-loved books. <laughs> and this one is uh, Scottish Pottery and it's by Graeme Crookshank. So I'll hold that a bit closer so you can see it. Oh, Scottish yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a black and white book and it just kind of tells you a little bit more about the, the history. So it's, a, it's really just a couple of pages, but it's very interesting as well. Just in case I find something on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. if you do get to one. <laughs> if, if I ever get to the beach. Maybe you'll yeah. find it on the street somewhere. You never know. Yeah. I in mean, a field. Do you, sorry, do you have any books you would recommend? The Garden 
blue and white pottery because oh. I find an abundance of blue and white pottery. We do actually. We were uh, we were gifted a book on blue and white pottery quite recently. Mm -hmm. um, it's been very good. It's been a very good resource. Do you remember the name? I can run and get it if you. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to get it? It's just on the um, underneath my table on the left hand side. Back in a second. <laughs> so you, you'll get to see that book. It's it's really oh, nice. It's uh, <laughs> like a telephone directory. It's really thick, and it uh, it covers blue and white pottery from I think the seventeen. 50s to the 1850s or something like that so it's a very specific period it's really interesting is that the one that has volume one and two it has two volumes mm. there's one that i am two not sure yeah Craig's just uh going upstairs to get it <laughs> so nicole there's there's yes. transferware there's mm -hmm. sponge and then there's, I assume, like hand painted stuff. Are there other techniques that you oh, know? Yeah, slipware, mockerware. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you gotta yeah, yeah. do videos about that now. <laughs> Funnily enough, <laughs> we have one coming up. Um, the reason this book has lots okay, of uh, markers. Oh, you froze. Sorry, you froze. <laughs> Kirsty, I can't hear you. Kirsty's frozen. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll carry uh, on, I guess. Uh, so, no. yes, we have. Ah, I think Kirsty's <laughs> back. I'm so back. Yes, I'm back. Was... I'm totally slow here. Sorry. Right. <laughs> In short, the answer is yes. Uh, we've been asked quite a lot about the difference between transferware and spongeware. So, we have a video coming up uh, very soon. I think it's that next week, maybe the week I after. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, on the subject of uh, transferware and uh, kind of compare and contrast so you can tell the difference. We point out some of the big differences between spongeware, transferware, mm -hmm. and how transferware was made as well. So, we look into that in a bit of detail. That's, that's actually next week. Yeah. And the other, and uh, the hand painted aspect usually or a lot of the times when you have spongeware at least for the uh, for the methane pottery uh, there's usually uh, an aspect of uh, hand painted uh, pieces in there as well so it's the the old heatherware and the early wear which you can uh, which was a, a lot of it was made for the uh, US market so that was exported quite heavily uh, and uh, there's it's got a sponge border and then it's got flowers and they're hand painted very cool I'm just going to show that book now. <laughs> okay, so this is the Dictionary of Blue and White Printed Pottery, and it's by A. W. Koish and R. K. Henry Wood. So I'll hold it in. All right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Can you? It's a really sick book. Yeah. Right. Uh, as I say, that we can make a wee bibliography of this and we can either, well, we'll post it on our site, we can uh, distribute to Kirsty as well. So if, if that's uh, something yeah, that people great. would be interested in. Yeah, you guys in. should put it in the notes of your video so that you yeah. can see it too. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll put I, it in there if you've not managed to. Uh, yeah, that's a question. One more question. Yeah. Is, there a play, is there a place in Scotland, say if I come up as a tourist, if I want to visit like a museum, like a local museum near, Edinburgh, I don't know, any other area who maybe has a museum? I'd say the National hmm. Museum Wait, of Scotland. Oh, the Scotland. National Museum of Scotland? The National Museum of Scotland is a fantastic museum. It's a very, very good museum. It has two halves to it now. Uh, it has one half which is entirely focused on Scots history ah, and the other okay. half is the section that's a much more traditional um, museum of the kind of colonial type that- Is that in Edinburgh? In That's in Edinburgh, yes. It's oh, in a, okay. a street called Chamber Street, which is uh, within the heart of Edinburgh. Yeah, I think I'm not sure if there's a lot of pottery in it, but is. it really, yeah, there is pottery <laughs> in it. Yeah, yeah, we've been, uh, and it's, it's free to go to, and it's really nice. You can go all the way up to the roof, several levels, and you can see all over Edinburgh from the top, so. Right, so it's, on my list then. <laughs> Kirkcaldy has a very small oh, museum. That? What was that? Yeah, Kirkcaldy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that Kirkcaldy. one. I was going to ask you about that one that had the cafe mm -hmm. and the museum. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, the Kirkcaldy has a, has a very small museum, um, and there are a couple of uh, display cases with the uh, with a couple of pieces of the pottery that was made in Kirkcaldy. We know that there was uh, there were um, excavation works in the nineties, and the museum has a lot of pottery from the beach, but it's not displayed. It's all in our archives. <laughs> yeah. Maybe okay. one day we can see it. <laughs> I think so we should get in touch with them about that at some point as well. Mm -hmm. See if we can get into the archives to show, yeah. you know, what kinds of things are there as well. It would be in their interest, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. I have a quick question: as um, what were the years that this was produced? Oh, the the spongeware. Um, yes. It was uh, yeah. It was mainly made between the eighteen eighties and the nineteen uh, thirties. The okay. uh, most of the pottery is closed, uh, kind of in the nineteen thirties, um, and yeah, that's when the production ceased. So we know that all the pieces that we find kind of date back to at least the nineteen thirties. Okay, great. Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Another question. Yeah. So what impact or what changes did the um, the industrial revolution had you know in the, in the potteries you know that time with all the machines did they uh, do you understand the question no yeah um, yeah i think well, the large factories in kirkcaldy and the kind of routinization of um, the classic model of routinization is based on henry ford's factory uh, which was about having a long conveyor belt and in a yeah. sense okay. there was a similar kind of routinization to the pottery manufacturer as well so um you would have specialists who were involved in making what were called saggers and that's where a, the super-sized kilns that you had in Kirkcaldy and throughout uh, the UK as well meant that you could fire vast vast amounts of pottery so nice. we went from having small clay uh, type kilns to these massive, massive brick kilns. So that was one of the big important things. The scale had uh, dramatically increased. One of the things that made that possible was the shift from, uh, well, obviously we needed flames. Um, so the coal industry in Scotland. And now in Fife, we cover this as well, um, but it's going to be a few weeks time before we do. Coming up. Uh, but coal has always been a very, very important thing for the economy in Fife. So that's the reason that you find so many of the potteries here is because they needed that vast abstraction of coal as well to fire mm. these kilns. I think was it eight 12, tons or eight, something? Twelve to eight, eight tons for one kiln? Yeah, yeah. So every time a kiln was fired, it required about between eight and twelve tons of coal. So the Industrial Revolution meant that we needed the rail network, we needed the mass uh, abstraction of coal, we needed vast uh, workforces. So people being brought together in towns um, throughout the UK basically facilitated that workforce thing as well. So it was all very much tied up in, in part of the process. So bringing a workforce into a town, uh, diversifying tasks so that people could do simple tasks that led towards the production of complicated uh, objects. Uh, so routinization and um, urbanization, mass abstraction of coal, it was all important to the, the pottery industry in Scotland. <laughs> And we're very well situated for all that to happen because primarily because of the coal as the prime mover. Do you know anything about the types of dyes or colors that were used to produce? I'm so surprised there are such bright and, and intense colors on the original pieces. Do you know any, uh, anything about what they used? They used metallic oxides. Uh, for instance, the transfer wear. We've just done a section on transfer wear, so I can say that um, cobalt uh, oxide was used extensively in the dyeing of um, uh, transfer wear. Mm -hmm. Some okay. of the other colours, again, it was iron oxides for kind of browns mm -hmm. and reddish colours. Um, but oxidized metals were largely the base parts of um, the, the colors that were used. And I think, again, because when they fire, they change color, they become bright. That and mm -hmm. uh, silica was really important as well. Um, mm -hmm. Silica, um, which, as you know, is very, very, very fine sand, which is also the base of glass. Um, it's one of the common glaze types. So that's what brings that real luster out in the colors as well. So metallic oxides and silica were the kind of they were very commonly used. Great, thank you. 
another question. <laughs> <laughs> Were there in the olden days, um, did they have a lot of trades like to like to, to Germany, to Europe? Did they work together, the companies or what? Was it mostly to America or did they trade towards the continent as well? Or did they have connections? Yeah. Mm -hmm. one, of the big, uh, one of the big trade partners for this part of Scotland was what were called the Lowlands. So Holland, the Netherlands, uh, okay. those parts. Yeah. We, we see architectural features from the Netherlands across some of the little villages that we look at um, along the Fife coast as well. Yeah. So we know that there was certainly, then this is really early on, uh, very early trade relationships uh, to Holland, the Netherlands, and also uh, important for Scotland as well, were, were the trade relationships with France. I don't know so much about the trade relationships with Germany. I do know that the, um, the English royal family and the German royal family were very, very closely connected. So I suspect that a lot of the trade that was happening through ports in England was probably more concerned with Germany than in Scotland, where we were concerned with relationships in France, Spain, and the Netherlands. Okay. I need to go to a Dutch beach. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's very much sea glass there. It's very Not much, cold. yeah. It's oh. it's pretty much as flat as uh, as yeah. anything around flat the North Sea. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But okay. flat and sandy is not good. <laughs> Scotland oh, um. actually traded a lot of coal, a lot of salt, because uh, so we used to make salt here on the salt pans on the coast, and um, <laughs> there was some of the major exports mm. from Scotland to the Netherlands. But wasn't there a time where suddenly the whole industry collapsed, where people go to America, they immigrated, and eventually people moved away from, from Scotland at one time to oh, collapse at one point? <coughs> yeah, that's right. you, Excuse you me. <laughs> there were there were a number of significant changes that happened. Um, I guess one of them was the depression and the economy fell out of many countries, and so the orders for uh, the pottery manufactured mm -hmm. goods were just it just wasn't there anymore. So that had a that had a very significant impact on pottery production mm -hmm. in this area. Um, in terms of there's a number of historical periods where people moved on mass. Um, yeah. from Scotland uh, to places like Canada, Australia. So certainly a little later on, 50s, 60s, there was mm -hmm. mass movements to Australia. Um, prior to that, and really coinciding with um, the growth of sheep farming in Scotland, which is a wee bit earlier, um, we have a huge, huge uh, number of Scots people moved out to Canada um, and America as well. Whether that had a significant impact on the pottery manufacturers at the, in the period that we're talking about, hmm, that's a good question. I think we need to look into that a wee bit, a wee bit more detail. That's a good question. I'm always interested in the social history of people and where that you know what what happens as a consequence of those kinds of movements. Yeah, I think sorry. you want to ask a question. Well, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, so you have. We there can't you go. hear you, so you need to. Yeah. It's just gonna language. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know all this stuff before, or you've learned it because of this? Well, there's two answers to that. One's Nicole's and one's mine. So I'll let Nicole answer her. Yeah, I guess a lot of the kind of knowledge and uh, about sea glass and, and pottery and, uh, you know, uh, kind of collecting it. I mean, I've been collecting sea glass and pottery for over a decade now. Uh, so I've, I've always been kind of interested in where things come from. But I think since we started the channel, we've really got a, a new appreciation for the area that we live in because we've kind of went to so many places that we'd actually never been to before. Um, and uh, yeah, also found out a lot of things, right? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. <laughs> um, the other side of the answer to that question is, um, before I even met Nicole, uh, I, I studied sociology um, and social anthropology as well but sociology particularly I think I studied that for three years and so I learned a lot about the industrial revolution in in the UK and Scotland right. about globalization uh, but my particular interest um, in social anthropology as I say is really the Pacific but it's 
an interest in people, the things that people do and the way that people kind of come together in communities. So I've taken that interest and the kind of uh, research interest that I had as an anthropologist and very much used them to think about um, the kinds of subjects mm. that we're looking at. So I, I tend towards the people's stories. Um, and I guess a lot of that, a lot of that I learned growing up in Scotland and traveling through Fife as a kid, going on holidays and so. Um, but as Nicole said as well, the channel's really been a, a great kind of platform for me to just go, I want to dive into this stuff and find it as much as I can. Um, so really have learned an awful lot more or have found new research subjects to delve into through doing the channel as well. So it's been great for that. Yeah, and I think, it's, I mean, every video takes between three and four days from filming and then editing. And it's usually one entire day where Craig's just doing the research for the history part and then finding images and writing that up uh, so that we do all our, our history sections that are part of our video. So they, they're actually, they all made especially for that video. So yeah, that's kind of how long it takes to put them together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to that's a lot one, of one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, one day's research, I mean, it, it took me 10 years to do my PhD, so one day's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait yeah, and we learn so much. Videos. <laughs> oh, man. No, they're amazing. always amazing videos. I've already started my third time of going through them again, yeah. because oh. they, they give me so much comfort, you know, we're stuck here, and um, we don't take any chances or go anywhere, so... I have your videos. Thank you. <laughs> you know, oh, thank help. you so much. I mean, I think that, that, they have a lot. They really do. I can't tell so, you how much that means to us, though. Mm -hmm. It really does mean a. It means so much to us that any any if anybody's able to sort of like sit back and take half an hour out of all this nonsense that we're going through just now, and we kind of maybe just open a wee window and that you can peer through and do that. It just that's magical. Mm -hmm. Task. Yeah. That's so yeah. it means it, huge amount of task. Yeah. Thank and you. and we all and welcome. It does mean so much to me and it clears my mind and I forget where I'm at and what's going on around me. And so I, mentally I think we all need that moment of time to just relax and be comfortable. And mm -hmm. that's what they do for me. So I appreciate it so very much. That's really oh, awesome. Thank you. Really <laughs> yeah. and especially for all of us that would love to be traveling, love to go different places. Right. It's really like it's like we're almost there with you. And we don't get to take the stuff home, but <laughs> but we <laughs> but then you tell us all about the history, which is every time you bring something back home, you go like, what is this? Now where is this from? And yeah. you've done such a great job of doing that. And plus I get to see all these fun friends that I've never met or that I haven't seen in person forever. <laughs> Thank you. Did I ask yeah, you? No, you guys question? do a great job. Sorry. Um, could I ask <laughs> you a couple of questions, if possible, please? Um, I've watched you for quite some time now, and it was because of you I started to see glass hunting. Um, <laughs> it, because of you, I now have tubs and tubs of glass right below me. <laughs> I mean, literally, I've got more going on than what to do with it. Um, but I do, I have started doing jewellery. I mean, I'm very new to jewellery, don't get me wrong. And I've started doing pinch bales and so on, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, I don't sell them, I give them away. I, I don't ever charge anybody for anything. I think, well, if that person is cheating up, I give them a little gift. And that's what I've always done. Um, I went and delivered 50 to a care home the other day. So, oh, but <laughs> it's just something that I do. Now, I know Nicole does every so often. She has some videos at the end where she'll show herself making some of the things. I wondered, would there ever be an option of you maybe doing a sideline with your own little channel where you can show people what they're doing and maybe giving them links as to what you're using the you know the equipment you're using and or so even on, on this channel just a special a special uh show where you talk where you show like how you drill yeah. it and all that stuff it'd be really yeah cool. i mean i've learned the drilling by watching a lot of youtube and this that and whatever mm -hmm. um i'm very lucky that we have a silversmith quite local to me because i like them i live in the northeast of scotland so i have got 
miles and miles of beach. I mean, I'm 10 minutes away from the beach. So, and then I have a boat on the west coast of Scotland. So I have the whole of the west coast of Scotland that I can explore when I'm out on the boat. Not that that happened in over a year due to COVID, but Sunday I'm away for a week on the boat. So I'll be oh. searching <laughs> for um, ski glasses. Jealous, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just thought it would be nice if you maybe had like a little wee sideline with your own little wee channel. You know, because there's a lot of people that are into starting into sea glass, mm. learning what to do with the sea glass. I mean, I've just been experimenting with absolutely everything from soldiering to pictures to jewellery to, you know. <laughs> yeah, Um. well, actually, we've we've just filmed, I think, uh, we're usually like three videos ahead. So we've already made the next three videos and I think in some of them there is uh, there are crafting things that aren't jewelry making so uh, and we've made a couple of things like um, a picture uh, with sea glass just the, the one with the lighthouse uh, or just like sh simple shell crafts that you can you can do very very, very easily just kind of putting them in a jar uh, so we've 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 done a couple of these crafting things and uh, we, we plan on, on uh, doing a few more. Um, there's actually a yeah. couple of us. There's, <laughs> there's, there's two things uh, that we could say. There's, we're thinking about doing a couple of different things. So a lot of people um, have been saying, as, as Sissy has there, that um, they find the videos relaxing. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I've been looking at is doing stuff that's just focused on that. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be as well that Nicole, I mean, we've spoken about this before, mm -hmm. um, that Nicole does a channel that is focused entirely on jewellery making. Mm -hmm. And instead, what we do is we then maybe separate out the things that we're doing so that we have a channel devoted to the jewellery making so mm -hmm. that it's more focused. We have a channel devoted to um, relaxation or just scenic shots of Scotland, the beaches, the waves, and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, we'll, de we'll let, definitely let you know when it happens. We've got a few videos sat by for that, mm -hmm. so there is the possibility. We are we are looking at how it is that we can maybe change what oh. we do. We find now we have lots of aspirations for what to include in the videos that we're doing already, mm -hmm. and it's maybe spilling over. So it might well be we have thought about doing just. That that um it's finding the time um yeah, I, and again I, the subjects to cover I would as well just stay on your own channel though because i think it's fun people who like to watch the ones like we did today that has everything they would be happy people who want to just do the scenic ones i mean they're all still scottish mudlarking and but it, it drives you yeah. fun to have a mix yeah i mean you know? if you kept it was a channel you would be drawn in even more people who might not have looked at sea glass hunting, but they mm. saw you doing a jewellery piece and then, then that gets them into the sea glass side of things. Well, yeah. that, that's certainly, I mean, what we have noticed is that our, our most watched video is actually the video on drilling sea glass. Um, we do a yeah. wee bit of mudlarking in that. We're, we're on one of the beaches and that we collect shells to make the, uh, I don't know if you can see it behind us, but there's a... Um, <laughs> I don't think you, you can see the see it. sun catcher. I'd have Just to about see it. it. Yeah, maybe you can see it there. It's yeah. hanging from <laughs> our. Uh, <laughs> we need <made> that. <laughs> So that's something you can make from finds. There was, yeah, sorry. There, there was, I, I just remembered that, yeah, we, we had thought about, you know, just showing the process of after we've collected sea glass, because there's a lot of uh, things so that, yeah, nice. yeah, there's a lot of things that, that go, go on in the background, really. So you get the sea glass home, uh, then well, you clean it, and then you sort it. So then you have the different kinds. You have the craft quality and jewellery quality. And what is that even? What is craft quality? What is jewellery quality? You know, there's maybe different kinds for different colours. So if it's a red piece, is it still jewellery quality? If it's a wee bit shiny? Yes, it is. I would say so, because <laughs> it's so rare. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, is is there? We're not sure. Yeah, is is there an interest if uh, if we were just to have the camera on my desk when I sort through hundreds of pieces to make one pair of earrings? So maybe there is. I don't know, <laughs> but maybe, yeah, that's maybe a good idea. Maybe in fast motion. <laughs> yeah, it does take hours. It's like a jigsaw yeah. with thousands of pieces. Well, and same with drilling. It does take forever. It's not like you just go, oh, I'm done, you know? So it, 
you know. No, you know, and we tend not to show that. We we tend to just say, okay, I've sorted these. These are now paired into pairs, and I've already drilled them. Now we're making the bracelet or something. But I've already spent a few hours to put these things together and choose the right settings that I feel are maybe complementary to the pattern. So if it's if I've got a flower on it, maybe I choose something with a flower. So. Um, yeah, so I think we'll, we'll definitely kind of look to expand our crafting into different areas. I love the tie-in of seeing you find some spongeware and then making spongeware jewelry. I mean, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. It's like you really get the idea of start to finish. And I think that was always important uh, to us that anybody who did see something that they wanted, they could take it right back to the place that it was picked mm -hmm. up that it was found on a coast and that they would have a little bit of the story of how it got there through the history that we look at mm -hmm. and that you would be able to see it being crafted as well so there was the whole you know the at least the that part of the life of those things we were very kind of keen to make sure that that was all there so it's really great to hear that that's mm -hmm. that's Appreciate enjoyable yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's the one thing about the channel I do like about yours is the fact that you're given the history of okay. where you are, what could possibly have been found because of that factories or whatever ever in the nearby. Yeah, because I know when I go to the beach where I am and I find all this blue pottery and I'm thinking, where on earth has this come from? Because I know there's never been pottery places up where we are. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, it baffles me as to why there's so much pottery where I and I go there on a daily basis because I go past it every day to go to work. I go past it to come home every day from work. Mm. But it's like, where is where is all this pottery um, coming from? Dump well? sites. <laughs> dump but sites. Then, yeah, but then the dump sites. I've tried researching dump sites. That was another thing I was asking. And I can't figure out how or where anybody even finds dump sites because I can't think of anywhere on my coast where there would be a dump site because we're too far up above the sea, generally, with the cliffs. Um, well, that's where they shoved it off the cliffs. That's the yeah, yeah. <laughs> Literally, everybody just threw and their trash. Also, out. private homes, if they're by the sea where I find things, it's um, maybe their privies that have eroded out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it does, it does surprise me the amount. It's the history. I mean, I am a huge archaeology geek. I mean, mm -hmm. that is my passion. And I've kind of found my archaeology my archaeological brain is now working on the beach looking thinking <laughs> okay who's held this who's ate from this who's drank from this where did they live how did they live you know it's a thousand and one i mean i know i'm never going to get the answers but the mind goes and you go into your own little world you know <laughs> and that's what i like about the channel is the fact that you're given all the history of the area that yeah. you're in um yeah, which made yeah. it nicer from a lot of other journeys. You know, I see a lot of other ones. I mean, there's a few that I watch. There's another Scottish family that I watch, and mother and daughter, and they're absolutely brilliant because her mum and her daughter both put a lot of history into theirs as well, um, yeah. which I like. Northern, Northern Mud Larks. That's the ones, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, they're in the borders. Yeah. And I absolutely love them because they do their research as well. They get the history of where they are or whatever. So it's quite nice. And then you see others and I'm thinking, I'm bored. Oh, I lost you. I lost you again. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's nice. So I was, another Thank question I'm going to ask you. What's the most unusual thing you've ever found? And have you been able to do anything with it? Good question. I can show you the most unusual. It's not me that found it, though. Yeah, yeah, we've got <laughs> a few things around it's here. It's an yeah, odd so. one. Mm -hmm, I sure. brought this along because I was going to show you if, if uh, we weren't sure we'd get so much interest in so many questions. So it's brilliant. It's fantastic oh, yeah. that we have. We've got a few um, things here yeah, <laughs> that we can I, show. I can't see them now. <laughs> oh, oh, no. I'll take a photo. <laughs> But this is probably the thing that I like the most that was found. Wow. And <laughs> that, it's very that heavy. You found that? <laughs> it's very heavy. It was actually my so father cool. that found this around 32 years ago. And it's a Victorian boot scraper. So oh. if you can see there, there are holes yeah. in the bottom of this where it was attached to the top step of a fancy house. 
and anybody walking up the steps of that house would scrape their boots across this to get the mud off them before walking into the house. Mm -hmm. And so that's my favourite find. This was found, uh, my, my father was a builder and he found that in Edinburgh when they were digging the foundations for, um, uh, I think, a bunch of uh, flats in, in the old town. So I, I can't date it. We use it as a decoration now. It always sits by our door as a black cat, which in Scotland's a lucky thing. Um, oh, good. Yeah, but that's, um, that's probably the thing that I, I, I'm most passionate about. Yeah. I, I, I didn't see it. Oh, it sorry. <laughs> oh, that's just like my cat. <laughs> <laughs> It's very cute. It's such a lovely thing. It lives by our door and it has done uh, for, for for very many oh, years, oh, for yeah. 30 odd years. It oh, used to be, that. it was just when it was found, it was a huge lump. You couldn't tell it was a cat. It was a huge lump oh. of rust and mud. And it was a, a good friend of mine who used to work in a, an engineering factory, took it in, had the whole thing ground down and uh, powder, powder coat painted. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. I love it. <laughs> Hmm. Most unusual thing. I think I might have something. <laughs> I'm not sure what this is. Either. Ah, well, <laughs> it's my most prized find, uh, and you might have seen it on my Instagram account, I'll, or maybe in the Beachcomber magazine. I'll try and get um, the to work for you for this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll try and show it to you. Now it's tiny. It's tiny, oh, yes. and it's uh, a cracker. Oh, it's a cracker it's charm, yeah. yeah. So this one, this one is green, and uh, I found it on the beach a few years ago, and it's my most prized find. Um, and since then, I've went on eBay and bought a couple of other ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll You're try the and one who up. outbid me. Keaton, if you haven't found them. <laughs> no, these ones, these ones I haven't found myself. I found them on eBay, yes. This one I found on the beach, so you can't really see what it is anymore. Um, but it was uh, a dachshund, like a oh. little dog. Sausage dog. Yes, yeah, sausage dog, yeah. So it used to be that, uh, and it's now this little weird shaped lump. So that's my most prized find, and... Uh, I'm never going to part with it. <laughs> um, no, that's for sure. Can, can I, I ask you that. something? Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question. I think my first video, uh, one I saw of you, was on the on the field. Because I, I didn't <gasps> see your beach uh, videos at first. I saw you walking over this in the winter. And my question is, so why is there so many potteries in those fields, which are not really, they're like, so how, how do you find uh, all these pottery things in the field? Is it a dump? Away from, no. Was the dump or did it keep drop things? Some farmers allow mm. people to use the Yeah, dumps. yeah, that's, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was just going to say, no, no, it's not a dump. But yeah, there was uh, um, <laughs> some farmers uh, used to allow uh, the, the, the communities or the, the, maybe the village uh okay. to well they, they would dig a big hole in the field and then the rubbish could be dumped in there and they would just cover it up and they would get money for ah. it so now ah. you know after plowing it's years and years good. you might eventually maybe some things come back up uh, but it's not um yeah we haven't found one that has uh has lots of bottles in it but I know that a couple of people are really lucky um, um, uh, a few people like outside Edinburgh they find uh, every now and again they go on fields and there must have been a big dump there because they find frozen. lots of frozen chalets and bottles and ah. marbles and uh, well what have I found? <laughs> oh, we found a couple of stoppers so that's uh, that's a I mean, great find for us they do say don't they that a lot of farmers if you go along farm boundaries that you're more likely to find some of their waste on their boundaries i mean i'm just surrounded by farms so i mean yeah I'm quite so we, yeah. yeah 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 we've, so we've the, just yeah. a few weeks ago we just went for for a nice relaxing walk and from from the path about five six meters away from me i spotted the clay pipe stem <laughs> and so <laughs> there i was back in the field so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, if you see one thing, you think, "Oh, I'm gonna have to have a look around here." And yeah, before you know it, you're mudlarking in the field without a camera, and then you find things. So. 
Yeah. <laughs> Always finding something. <laughs> But we have the same frustration with the idea of dumps as well. We know that lots of people find dumps and they pull out, uh, I don't know how many bottles and yep. all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> we hang around the coast and we're beach bums. Really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always thought I, I could, my million dollar idea is a map, a worldwide map of dump sites from a hundred years ago. And I, I would love have that. A million of those. <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, they, there used to be maps available for Scotland and they did show old dump sites, but they have been <coughs> removed and you can no longer access these. But for England uh, and Wales, I believe you can still access old maps that actually show like, especially around the London area where there were dump sites. So it's much easier for them to find them. Yeah. I think in areas like London as well, it's yeah. it's quite heavily policed because it's yeah, a, yeah, a large sure. urban centre. There's a lot of people around all the time, whereas in rural Scotland, mm -hmm. um, it, it has been known that when people have found dumps, they've taken in large diggers and really made a bit of a mess. Oh, so mm -hmm. I think that's that's maybe why mm -hmm. that uh, record of where these dumps are has been uh, yeah, gotten rid of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The minority spoil it for the majority. <laughs> yes, indeed. Absolutely. Well, I better get working on my map then. <laughs> oh, my if we can help. <laughs> Nicole, do you think, Nicole, do you think we have water dumps in Germany? Because I wouldn't know where to where to look. Do you think we used to have them? Um, I'm not sure about bottle dumps, but I'm following, there are a couple of groups on Facebook uh, and uh, they are for bottle collectors in Germany uh, and they mainly find things in the forest. I need, uh, we, I live in near forest. I should go. Oh, there. yeah. So, get out yeah. there. So, there you go. <laughs> if you go around the forest, and usually what, what, what people see is if you see a little piece of pottery or a couple of pieces of pottery on the top, then you're possibly near a dump. Uh, but sometimes people just stumble across like like bottles that are just on, on okay. the top and they're just left there. So, it might be worth just having a wee kind of look around the area. But I think you can also find clay pipes in fields in Germany. I've heard of people ah, who find that. I so. to go. In the summer, I try. Maybe I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like to, t again, about your videos, I really enjoy the history part of it because I'm really interested in the history of Scotland. I like to visit and I just, the way Craig, you know, everything that you go to the beach and then you suddenly have a little story regarding you know, the town, or maybe there was a train station and everything was connected. And that I like that aspect as well, you know, in your videos. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, largely, as I said earlier, when, when we kind of came together to do this channel, um, it was the fact that Nicole loved sea glass and had a passion for that and a good knowledge of the pottery and the potteries. And my interest in that kind of social history, the kind of life in the place was really, yeah. I think, what I... What I was really passionate about, what I kind of contribute more than anything, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I do like your jewelry. <laughs> I, do. I love your jewelry. <laughs> Nothing against. But it's just, it's so, it's just such an interesting history. I, I did. Yeah, no, it's, 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 I it's really England. nice thing, yeah. I did live in England, but I lived in Derbyshire. So I, oh, I know the area around Cheshire and Derbyshire and Staffordshire and all that area. So. Ah. Lots of pottery in Staffordshire. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that would be fun to find. <laughs> Some figurines. Do you, was all the pottery that you find in your guys' area, is that um, mostly dishes and plates and stuff like that? Yeah. It's not figurines. Stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mostly. Uh, it's mostly, um, some. sometimes it's identifiable. If you turn it around, it's maybe a, um, a, the, the, the rim of a plate that you can see, um, or it's maybe, uh, if it's uh, like really shaped, then you know it's maybe part of a cup. Uh, sometimes, uh, as you saw in the video, you found a, we found a teapot, a teaspot? Yeah, teaspot. Teapot. Yeah. <laughs> teapot. <laughs> <laughs> Deep hot spot. Yeah, so we found that, uh, and uh, yeah, that's usually a, a kind of fun find. Uh, but yeah, you know that's part of it, a, a teapot then, or you find the handles. Usually they're kind of, you know, kind of half, half moon shape. You put them together, you get a nice heart shape. <laughs> yeah. 
I was bringing a spare battery because our light seems to be getting dull. <laughs> <laughs> As I sit here, we seem to be getting greyer. <laughs> well, we, we probably shouldn't keep you guys much longer anyway. Oh. It's been about an hour and it was so, so much fun. I'm so thankful to everybody who came today and especially our Beachcombing Club members who help us put these events on. But um, mostly to you too. Keep doing what you do. It's so much fun. Um, I will um, send out a link to you of this uh, recording. Um, for those of you who aren't in Beachcombing Club, if you want to just drop me an email at club at Beachcombing Magazine or contact uh, Nicole and Craig, I'll send you a recording. Um, and this has been so much fun, and I hope we get to do it again. If you guys are up for it, it would be really, really fun. So. Yeah, it's been lovely. It's been really nice to have a chat and to see yeah. some familiar faces and to meet some new faces. Yeah. So, so. It's been really lovely. Thank yeah. you. And thanks for inviting us to take part in this. Thanks, Thank really you. Yeah. thanks, thanks yeah. for having us. And I can't wait to see you guys in person. Yes. <laughs> yeah, do come over when it's good. <laughs> yeah, I definitely will. I'll be there. Oh, it's my first trip. So there you go. We put some <laughs> sea pottery aside for you. <laughs> yeah, you. Just throw it on the beach for me, okay? <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for letting me uh, join well, because I so uh, guessed your little glass. So thank you so much. This has been oh, cool. Thanks. Yay, Thanks congratulations. So How many was it? 142, I think that was your was your yeah, actual total. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Get done. Get done. <laughs> <laughs> Great meeting all of you. Kim, I'll send you the link to my map when it's done and then I'll come on the boat with you. <laughs> well, I've yeah, actually yeah, just yeah, I think I'm, yeah, yeah. That yeah, sounds I'm, lovely. Yeah, we haven't been to the west coast yet, or uh, well, uh, or very up, uh, very far up north either. So, mm. well, you're not that far from me, in all fairness. Cause my brother lives in Kirkcaldy. No, Carnoustie. Oh. My brother lives in Carnoustie, so I'm down there quite a lot to see him. But I'm up in Aberdeenshire, so I'm not a oh, million man. miles away. So. Oh. No, Scotland's a wee place. <laughs> so the nice thing about it. <laughs> you're never that far away from a coast. No, oh, we're not. Well, beautiful guys. spot. Well, thank you for taking Appreciate us to it. the beach, guys. Thank you well, so, thanks much. so much. Thanks so much for everybody coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.